Now that we know the basics about pore elasticity, now we can start to discuss how to measure the pore elastic parameters alpha and n. We're going to see three methods. The first method is just an extension of the equations that we obtained in the previous lecture, that for a material that had a connected porosity and was made of an isotropic material, and homogeneous everywhere in the rock, we derive the equation that alpha will be 1 minus the jacketed bulk modulus divided the bulk modulus of the solid. All right. In this method, what we usually do is to measure the bulk modulus. Remember that this can be done through a jacketed test and it is relatively easy to do. So uh, if you're using a pore fluid, then you're going to need to, to jacket your rock so there is no connection between the confining pressure and the pore pressure. But for example, if you are dealing with a dry rock, you could also measure these uh, bulk modulus by measuring the Young modulus, the Poisson ratio, and estimating uh, what is the bulk modulus through the theory of elasticity. Elasticity, isotropic elasticity, predicts that the bulk modulus is going to be three times one, uh, let me, I don't remember this, one minus or one plus, it is uh, one minus two times the Poisson ratio. So if, for example, you have measurements of Young modulus and Poisson ratio, you could estimate your uh, bulk modulus from this equation. And again, here we're loading the entire rock. And this is the bulk modulus of the rock. Okay, um, one more method that we could use in order to approximate K is also, for example, if from the field we know what is BP, we know what is Vs, and we know what is the density. From here, we can also get, as we have seen before, the Young modulus, the Poisson ratio, and eventually also what is the uh, bulk modulus. Did I say bulk modulus first? This is the Young modulus. Young modulus, Poisson ratio, and bulk modulus. All right, so this is something that we're going to measure in this method. On the other hand, uh, and this is the, the weakness of this first method, is that uh, uh, we have another variable in this equation, and this is Ks. And in this case, Ks, or the bulk modulus of the solid, is going to be either assumed or is going to be estimated through some other equation. Let's start with a simple case. And for example, let's say that we have a sandstone made purely out of quartz. In this case, let me add an asterisk here so I have space to continue on the right. Let's say that we have a rock which is made completely out of quartz, then Ks is going to be the bulk modulus of the mineral. And in this case, if we have a, a rock completely made out of quartz, this is going to be the bulk modulus of quartz. And this will be, for example, let's say a sandstone, which is 100% uh, quartz. Remember that in this assumption, we have also assumed that the porosity is all connected. For example, I was thinking about Fontainebleau sandstone. Uh, Fontainebleau sandstone is almost entirely made out of quartz. And you may be tempted to use Ks for quartz equal to 36 gigapascals. However, uh, in Fontainebleau sandstone, not all the porosity is connected. You have what is called occluded porosity. So in this case, this equation and this method is going to be wrong 
in case you have this occluded porosity. I think occluded is with two C's. Let me correct this. And this is occluded porosity. Why? Because if you had occluded porosity in some regions, your rock is going to be actually softer than 36 gigapascals of bulk modulus. All right, but still, you know, this is a very useful equation. Uh, we could also extend it in the case in which we have a multi-mineral sample, or if we had, if we knew what that occluded porosity is, we could take it into account by using what are called volume average equations. So basically, these are upper and lower bounds of the possible value of Ks, or the bulk modulus of the solid. And there are several types of these equations. Uh, usually, uh, we have the Royce average as a lower bound, the Boyd average as an upper bound, and also very popular equations are the hashing strickman bounds in order to predict uh, the average modulus of a sample which is heterogeneous or multi-mineral. All right, you could do that, and if you do that, and if in addition, after you calculate or estimate Ks, uh, you also measure uh, what is the porosity of the sample, and in this case would be the, the connected porosity, then now you would have alpha, and you would have also n, because you have your Ks and your alpha already. Okay, this is method number one, probably the most popular method, to determine the bio coefficient of a of a uh, homogeneous sample um, okay homogeneous and isotropic sample for the case of an anisotropic rock the the method is similar and we'll see this when uh, we combine pore elasticity when an with anisotropy Let's go to method number two. And let me scroll down and start with method number two. All right. In method number two, uh, we're not going to assume what is the, the value of Ks anymore, but instead, well, we're going to do what is uh, we're going to do what is called a unjacketed test, and with this unjacketed test, and let me bring uh, the top equation so you see the difference. The bio coefficient alpha is going to be equal to one minus k divided K and jacketed, where now this K is not assumed anymore, but it is a measure. And how do we measure now this unjacketed uh, bulk volume, uh, bulk modulus? Well, there are uh, two ways of measuring these unjacketed modulus or the modulus of the skeleton, and this is going to be. Uh, either as the, the method says by doing an unjacketed test in such unjacketed tests what we do is we subject the rock to a confining pressure and pore pressure loading which is the same we already discussed this before and now I'm going to repeat the plot but I'm going to assume a simpler geometry just to make this example easier to understand uh, so let's imagine that we have a rock made out of more or less a single pore where all the porosity is connected and this is a three-dimensional uh, sample so where what we see is just the pore in the middle uh, with the unjacketed test then what we're going to do is to apply a pressure with the fluid which is all the same from outside 
and the fluid can also get inside and apply pressure on the walls of the pore body and also on the walls of the pore throats. Okay, so what happens if you run such experiment? Well, basically what you're going to be doing in this case is you're going to be compressing the solid part. Notice that everywhere in the solid you have a compression. And most solids are going to shrink when you apply a compression to them. As a result, from this kind of test, uh, you're going to get the unjacketed uh, modulus, which if this is equal, uh, if the solid doesn't have any voids or anything, this is going to be exactly equal to the bulk modulus of the solid. All right, so let me just uh, finish this plot over here in the unjacketed test. Then we'll increase the pressure. Let me actually put this here. You'll increase the pressure. You measure the volumetric strain. And what this is going to give you is a relationship in which the slope of that is going to be the unjacketed bulk modulus. All right, so I, I hope that uh, you all can visualize what's going on here. But now let's make it a little bit more complicated and let's include the case of the occluded porosity. What about if that solid had small pores, all of which are unconnected? What would be now the unjacketed mod modulus? Would it be equal to the bulk modulus of the solid part without any occluded porosity? The answer is no. In this case, the unjacketed modulus, if I have a occluded porosity, which is not connected, then this unjacketed modulus is going to be smaller. And that's why we need to perform this unjacketed modulus, modulus test in order to actually measure what this modulus is in here. We cannot just assume the value to be equal to the volume of the solid. All right, so how do we actually do this? And there are several options over here. We could do this test, for example, with water. And uh, there is a problem with that and that uh, one of the problem is that, uh, for example, when we are testing shales, some shales are uh, clay sensitive or they are sensitive to, to water, the clay is sensitive to water. And as a result of that, instead of a contraction, when we just expose the, sh the shale to water, uh, we could have swelling. And that has nothing to do with the, with the poor elastic parameter. So that's a problem. Also, some of these tests, uh, we do them inside a bath and we put electric transducers inside the bath. And if that bath is made of water and, and that is electrically conductive, that's also it's not going to be good because it's going to cause a short circuit. So that's another problem that uh, we have in this method. So you could say, okay, uh, instead of water, I'm going to use oil and I'm going to submerge this rock into oil and measure uh, that uh, compression or that contraction as I increase the pore pressure. And well, that's not going to affect the clays, that's not going to cause a short circuit, but uh, some oils have high viscosity and in that case, uh, it might take a much longer time for some rocks, especially tight rocks, uh, for the pore pressure to equilibrate everywhere in the pore space. So these experiments are going to be longer. Uh, sometimes you can use some other fluids, uh, non-polar fluids that have low viscosity in order to do this test. And you could do uh, such a test with those low viscosity fluids. And since we're talking about viscosity, we could also say, well, 
let's instead of gas let's use uh, instead of oil let's use gas because gas has a low viscosity and uh, and that's a that's a good solution that's not going to cause uh, short circuits as you put the sample inside a in an elect electrically equipped uh, vessel and uh, it's going to work well but the problem with that is that uh, usually you should uh, keep your vessel relatively small and your vessel also should be made of a material that is not brittle so in case that there is some there is any problem with uh, with the pressure that uh, your vessel doesn't break and doesn't blow up right that that would not be good and in general uh, for relatively small samples and small vessels uh, this is safe but it's uh, not desirable for large uh, containers or for large vessels and especially for very uh, high pressure the higher the pressure and the higher the volume the higher the strain energy that you're going to have in a vessel and uh, if in the case of an accident the higher the release of energy is going to be all right this is a method known as the unjacket test and there is one more variable that we can do in this test uh, which is part of the same method and which is a not really an unjacket test but does almost the same thing and in this case what we do is to increase the confining pressure and the pore pressure simultaneously notice that in the first case of the unjacketed test our uh, so-called their saggy effective stress is zero at all times why because the total stress is equal to the pressure and the pore pressure is the pressure too so the effective tersagi stress total stress minus pore pressure is zero even though we have an effective stress which is zero we are causing a deformation of the rock because it's just a solid itself that it is shrinking in this alternative method what we can do is to have some effective stress which is different than zero but we increase both of them simultaneously keeping a constant Terzaghi effective stress all right so let me write the equation for that in this case the effective stress will be pc minus pp it could be different than zero but it's going to stay constant so for example if i increase the pore pressure 10 mpa i also increase the confining pressure 10 mpa and all the formation i have is just going to be a result of the increase of pore pressure using this method i can circumvent those complications of having fluids uh, that i don't want in contact with my electronics or fluids that i don't want in contact with uh, my rock as well that might produce some other effects that I am not looking for yeah I almost forget to say one more thing about the gas you should also test with uh, when you're testing with gas a non-sorptive fluid there are some rocks especially the ones that have organic matter that when exposed to certain kinds of fluids like nitrogen methane carbon dioxide they will swell in response to absorption and that also has nothing to do with the pore elasticity that's another phenomenon so you should use uh, helium argon or any other uh, gas which doesn't sorb onto the rock okay this is method number two a little bit more complicated than the than the first one and it includes actual laboratory testing and let's see method number three which is my favorite 
In method number three, we're going to take advantage of the first equation of pore elasticity. And the first equation of pore elasticity tell me, tells me that the mean stress is equal to effective stress in terms of strain, bulk modulus times volumetric strain, minus the VO coefficient times pressure. Or at the end of the day, what this equation is really telling us is that any strain that I have is a result of the VO effective stress. So let me move this uh, term to the other side. So this is going to be SM plus alpha P. And if I just solve for strain, volumetric strain, this is going to be 1 over K of the SM, which is a mean stress, times alpha P, where what I have in between parentheses is the BO effective stress. All right. So let's see how I can take advantage now of this equation. What we're going to do is we're going to perform a test with alternating increases of confining pressure and pore pressure. And of course, this is going to be a jacketed test. All right. So let me make a schematic here of the sample. This is our sample, and usually to this sample, we're going to have end caps on the top and the bottom. And uh, let me move this a little bit to the left. So it looks like they are perf perfectly aligned. Okay, uh, and we said that we're going to have a jacket. Let's assume that we don't have any, uh, sorry for that. Okay, uh, let me scroll to here. This is where it was. This is going to be our membrane of our jacket on both sides and here I'm going to have outside a confining pressure applied with the fluid which I'm going to call PC notice that this pressure goes in all directions and inside the rock I'm going to have a pore pressure. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase confining pressure and pore pressure in stages. Let me just finish this drawing and I'll go with that. All right. So the first step what we're going to do is uh, usually we want to keep always the confining pressure larger than the pore pressure so that the membrane doesn't inflate like a balloon and if we start somewhere over here we first increase the confining pressure and once we have a, a given confining pressure then we increase the pore pressure and I continue with these alternating cycles where I keep one constant and I increase the other. What is going to be the result of this? Uh, the result of this is going to be that the volumetric strain that I measure for the portal solid is going to look something like this. Let me plot volumetric strain 
in the x-axis and here let me plot the Terzaghi's effective stress PC minus PP without a correction by alpha okay the result is going to be a signature that looks more or less like this where you can see that there is not a unique relationship between Terzaghi effective stress and volumetric strain and that's exactly what that equation is telling me it's telling me that if I want to have a unique relationship between volumetric strain and this other thing between parentheses I need to correct it by alpha and I need to correct it by the BO coefficient at higher pressures, as I include the increase the pore pressure, I'm going to start compressing the solid, and that's what gives me this shape, which is uh, varying as I increase the pore pressure. So, if I want to get now that unique relationship, what I'm going to have to do is notice that this is just a question of a line. What I'm going to have to do is I'm going to find the I'm doing many cycles here I'm not just repeating uh, let me clarify that I'm not just repeating uh, the line on top of each other um, I'm going to have to find what is the parameter alpha that allows me to find that correction so that when corrected by alpha all the data collapses in one line and one more thing i'm going to get from this test is that notice that the slope of this test is the bulk modulus so if this is equal to one this is going to be the bulk modulus k which bulk modulus the uh, bulk modulus of the portal solid or what we also call the jacketed uh, pore modulus and uh, that's basically the the process in order to calculate alpha uh, with this method and notice that now we also have k so uh, alpha is going to be determined through a fitting process and we should say to be a little bit more uh, elegant by error minimization and as soon as I determine alpha and I also determine k so I determine both of those at the same time and from here I can also determine what is going to be ks right ks from this equation that I have over here is going to be uh, equal to uh, let's do the math I need to move this one uh, to the other side and it's going to be 1 minus alpha is going to be k divided 1 minus alpha uh, so now I can determine all the parameters notice again that ks uh, is going to be the the bulk modules of the solid but now we haven't assumed any anything about the properties of the solid part or we haven't assumed if there is connected porosity or not so in here we don't really mean of uh, s for solid but it's more the bulk modulus of the solid skeleton and it might have uh, occluded porosity or not it's, uh, it's something that depends on the rock because we have directly measured what this KS or unjacketed bulk modulus is alright so in order to finish up uh, this lecture let me show an example of determining the BO coefficient with this method following exactly what I said uh, before and uh, just give me one sec that I bring the window here into the 
into this screen. Okay, so here we have an example where we have done a test in which we did exactly what uh, I was mentioning before. We have pore pressure, confining pressure, we also have a deviatoric stress in this case, and we alternate these uh, cycles and here, for example, you can see the plot that I showed before with actual numbers of the value of pore pressure, confining pressure and pore pressure and how that uh, alternates in steps. In this example, actually, we did it uh, back and forth by increasing both confining pressure and pore pressure in alternated fashion and then decrease those two as well. When we plot the calculation of volumetric strain or the measured volumetric strain as a function of the Terzaghi effective stress, uh, we can see that that data does not collapse in a single uh, trend, but if you find the appropriate BO coefficient, we can make that trend to collapse into a single trend. And how do we do this? Uh, it's done basically by Assuming that I have a given alpha, for example, I could assume alpha equal to 1, all right? If for the Terzaghi effective stress, this is just simply the mean stress minus the pore pressure. In this case, this is 3 times the confining pressure plus the deviatoric stress divided by 3. That's mean stress minus the pore pressure. If I plot this one uh, with respect to volumetric strain, this is what I get. But here, if I assume a BO coefficient and I recalculate this effective stress, if it is equal to 1, then it's going to give me the same thing that I see on the top. But if I start changing this, for example, let's take a guess 0.8. Or well, let's just increase first in a, a, from 0.1. Let's say 0.95. All right. Did you see how this cha changed? Now the error is smaller. The R coefficient is higher. So that means I'm getting closer. So let's go to 0.90. And 0.9, it looks pretty good. But let's see if we are, uh, we can get a better guess. Let's try 0 0.85. 0 0.85, um, no. Actually, I went onto the other side, uh, underestimating this value of the BO coefficient, so I have now a large error. So actually 0.9 was pretty good. And I might want to go ahead and try, let's say, 0.91, and actually that looks better, and let's say 0.92, and not that much, so maybe 0.91 is a BO coefficient for that. And you could automate this to do this error minimization automatic and to calculate the absolute lowest error and the corresponding BO coefficient, in that way, get the BO coefficient that in this case is 0.91. And in this example, also the, the bulk modulus is equal to uh, what are the units here? I believe this is PSI. Let me check. Yeah, this is PSI. So the bulk modulus in this case is 400,000. Uh, 429,557 PSI, almost 0.4 million PSI. That's a bulk modulus of this material. And I can use, with that K, I can use, let me change it to what you see exactly over there, 429,557, and with that value, which is equal to 2.96 gigapascals, I can calculate what is the bulk modulus of the solid, or in this case, is the matrix. Actually, this is more appropriate subscript for that. And it's equal to the bulk modulus of the pore solid divided by one minus the uh, one minus the uh, bulk modulus. So, or in this case, is 32.92 uh, 
uh, gigapascals. Okay, let me check this equation. Okay, no, it's the bulk modulus divided the BO coefficient. One minus the BO coefficient. Okay, there, that's the right equation. And in this case, it's 32.92. Notice this is a sandstone, and uh, it doesn't have a, a bulk modulus of the rock matrix equal to 36 gigapascal. In this case, this is lower. And it makes sense, because there might be uh, some porosity which is not connected, or there might be some other uh, pieces of mineral uh, which have a lower uh, bulk modulus. 